I'll start out by pointing out that among mammals and indeed many animals in general, uh, males are often larger and more aggressive than females. And this is because there's often a very great difference in reproductive potential between females and males. If you take these female red deer, they, each female in, invests in, first, in each offspring a lot. She gestates, she is pregnant, and then she lactates. And she can only produce a limited number of uh, offspring over her lifetime. But the successful red deer male can mate with one male and then move on immediately and mate with another. And so this sets up competition between males, intense competition to be the successful male. And as Darwin pointed out, this competition led to uh, the evolution of antlers, uh, weapons, large size, and importantly, aggressive behavior. So often males compete singly in this competition, but there are species where males group together to compete with other groups of males. And so I'll be talking about that today in such cooperation among males in competition in these two species, lions and chimpanzees. So I'll start with lions. And uh, the Serengeti lions have been studied in, in Tanzania have been studied for the last, uh, since the 1960s. I worked on this study for 12 years, and Craig Packer is still continuing it. The, Lions in the Serengeti uh, that have been studied live along the, the borders of the uh, woodlands and onto the plains. And I'll be talking here about a study by Anna Mosser and Craig Packer where they looked at 38 years of data on 46 prides in this area to look at group um, territoriality. So lions live in permanent social groups, prides, and the core of the pride is the adult females, about, uh, about four, five adult females and their offspring. And at any one time, there is a coalition of adult males resident in the pride, but these have come from elsewhere and they're generally there only for a year or a few years before they are ousted or move on. Females are territorial. They defend their group territory by roaring, by patrolling, and uh, by attacking um, intruders, and they have even been known, there's some evidence that they have sometimes killed cubs from females of other prides and even adult females in other prides. So they're fiercely territorial. And it's clear from the studies of uh, these Serengeti lions that larger prides do better. When they have more females, they are able to supplant small prides. And this is illustrated here in this slide where we have three prides which are contesting river confluence, which is a particularly good spot in the Serengeti. I mean, river confluences have, uh, tend to attract the most prey animals. So here we have three prides, the pink one with nine females, the blue one with two females, and the green one with average of 1.6 females in 1991 and 92. And you can see that by 93, the green pride had gone extinct. The blue pride had been pushed out from the contested area, and the largest pride had taken over this river confluence. So where do males fit into this picture? All males leave the natal, their natal pride, the pride where they were born, before breeding. This is probably to avoid inbreeding. And they leave with their male peers. So they keep very strong bonds with their pride mates. And then they try to take over another pride. There's competition between groups of males to take over another pride. And number, the larger uh, group of males generally wins in such a competition. During the takeover, males fight and evict all the resident males and the sub-adults, and they kill the cubs. Uh, this here, you can see a young male with a newly killed cub in his mouth. Killing the cubs brings the females into reproductive condition sooner. So there's conflict at first with the females in the pride. But once the males have settled and taken over the pride, they breed with the females, and then their interests are aligned with the resident females. And the Males assist the females in patrolling and defending the pride territory. So in this study, it's clear that um, 
female reproductive success. So in the top graph, uh, the left, uh, the x-axis is the um, female reproductive success, depending on number of adult male neighbors. So in other words, when density is high there are, and uh, pride is surrounded by a lot of others, females are not producing as many cubs as when density is low. And then the bottom graph shows um, the interesting finding that the number of male neighbors, so that's uh, along the bottom axis, as, that, as the number of male neighbors increases, the, monthly, the, the rate of female mortality and wounding, mortality in the dark bars, wounding in the light bars, increases. So what seems to be happening here is that males um, are actually, you, you might think that males would view females in neighboring prides as potential future mates. But in fact, what seems to be happening is they are supporting their current females, uh, and they are actually uh, even killing females in, in adjacent prides. Presumably, this helps to defend the territory and increase the reproductive success of their current females and their offspring. So then, to sum up with, uh, with lions, uh, we have females as the core of the group. Females are territorial, but males also band together and um, compete to take over prides, but then they cooperate with other males in the group and the females to defend the group territory. So now we move on to chimpanzees. Of course, chimpanzees are one of our two closest living relatives. And they uh, resemble many human societies, but only a handful of other mammals in that males are philopatric. Males stay in the group they were born all their lives. Um, chimpanzees live in permanent social groups called communities. So the males stay there with their kin, uh, and females disperse before breeding. And especially in East African chimps, females as shown by these smaller circles, uh, tend to spend a lot of time in smaller core areas within the community range. They're less social than the males are, but the males together patrol the community range and they uh, defend it against neighboring communities. So here I'm going to show you that the males patrol the periphery of their range if they meet a group or hear a group of roughly the same size, they call back and forth and display and then generally um, withdraw back into their territories. But sometimes they make longer journeys into the, uh, the territory of a neighboring community. They're very stealthy and quiet and spend a lot of time gazing into the territory of the next community. And you can see there are four males here, no females. They walk incredibly stealthily. They try not to step on dead leaves. I once stepped on dead leaves when I was following a patrol like this. The male turned around and threatened me. <laughs> These males found a young adolescent male from the next community. And then they mounted a very severe and terrible attack on him and left him probably mortally wounded. So we see males killing neighbors. They kill adult males. They kill infants. Um, they occasionally kill even adult females. So what's all this killing about? What advantage do they get from killing? This, is, uh, this shows a study by colleagues um, John Mitani, David Watts, and Sylvia Amsler of a very large community, the Ngogo community in Uganda, in Kibali Forest. And the gray areas show the community range over from 1999 to 2008. And the black lines show uh, patrols by males in this, this uh, community over that period. And then on the right, you see um, black circles, which show where individuals were killed. And so over this nine-year period, 21 individuals of other communities were killed by these males. These included infants, males, and one adult female. And what you can see is that a lot of the killing was up in the north um, east of the community range. And in 2009, 
the community range expanded into that area. So by killing, they apparently were able to expand their range. Now, we don't know. It seems likely that perhaps this was the, there were more males in this community than the adjacent communities. We don't know, because usually people who study chimps only study one community. But at Gombe National Park, we've been able to study two communities at once and actually look at the importance of relative number of males on uh, use of shared range or overlapping range. So in 1994, um, we had two communities, Mitumba and Kasakela, five males in the Mitumba community, 11 in the Kasakela community. By 2004, the Mitumba community was down to three males. They actually went down to three, two after that. Uh, the Kasakela community just lost one. So we were able to look at how they used the contested area, which was, is the area of overlap uh, by the two communities. Um, and we, could, we found that, as you might expect, when the Mitumba males were least outnumbered by the Kasakela males, they spent more time in that contested area. And conversely, with the Kasakela males, as they outnumbered the Mitumba males at greater odds, then they used that community, that disputed area more. So number of males matters. So what is all this about? What, what are the advantages of territoriality and, and defending a group territory? There are various possibilities. Perhaps they are gaining access to food resources which um, improve the, the lives of both them and their females and the, their offspring. Or they might, be, uh, they might immediately be able to capture more adult females. We were able to look at the effect of territorial expansion in Gombe because the main Kasakel community fluctuated in range over an 18-year period from very small in 1981 to much larger in 1997. So we were able to look at the effect of this territorial expansion on a number of measures. First of all, we were during this time at, at Gombe, they were weighing the chimps regularly. Uh, as you can see, you put a banana in the tin and the top of the spring, uh, the rope. And after taking a number of factors that influence body weight into account, we find that when the range size is largest, the chimps tend to be on average heavier than they are when the range size is small. So this, is, this suggests indeed that they are gaining access to more food resources by expanding the territory. We also looked at female reproductive rates. Uh, this graph shows interbirth interval for particular females when the community range is a different size. And you can see that uh, when the community range is small, the interbirth intervals are longer than when the community range is large. So in other words, females are able to reproduce more quickly when the community range is large. And presumably, this has to do with them being able to get more food and produce uh, and rear their young more quickly. We didn't find that uh, males immediately captured more females by increasing their range size. And th there's no relationship between number of adult females and community range size. However, over the next two decades, uh, the community, Cascade community range stayed large and eventually they gained more females as young immigrant females settled into their territory. But, but ex community expansion doesn't immediately result in capture of adult females. Well, over different studies of chimps, um, there are very great differences in rates of killing and, of course, uh, factors influencing into community violence or vi male violence and killing are uh, uh, of great interest to this symposium. So my colleague Mike Wilson recently has uh, polled all of the people studying chimps across Africa, um, 18 different chimp sites shown here, or chimp communities by the black circles, and also four bonobo communities. And he has compiled uh, in this collaborative study, rates of killing in these different communities. And they do, killing happens in almost all of the chimp communities, but not the bonobo communities. And one question was uh, it, that there are people who suggest that ch uh, killing in chimps is induced by human disturbance, by humans feeding them, 
or by uh, fragmentation of habitat because of human activities. But we did not find that, um, that killing rates were correlated with human disturbance. But we did find that rates of killing increase with the number of adult males in the community. And of course, the, the very large, uh, the point up at the top there is the Ngogo community. And also, killing rates were higher when population density was higher, very much as, we, as was found in the lions. Well, I've talked about violence and killing, but when we look at the males within groups in both these species, they form very strong friendly bonds. And uh, the male lions stay for life with their partners, and they, um, they spend hours in friendly contact. Ch male chimps do compete with other males within the group for females, but they also spend hours in friendly contact and form very strong bonds which last for many years. These are often but not always kin. So to sum up then, intergroup conflict is a major context of male aggression. In lions, females of the uh, Philopatric sex sex, they are kin and they defend the territory, but they are aided by groups of males who, who also cooperate um, in this intercommunity conflict. In chimpanzees, uh, like many human societies, males are philopatric and they cooperate to defend the group territory. And we don't really see females very involved in the territorial behavior. Territories protect females and young and their food food resources in both these species. Lethal conflict occurs more often at high densities, but males have strong within-group social bonds. And given our close phylogenetic relationship with chimpanzees, it seems likely that the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees shared these characteristics, and that male cooperation for between-group violence has deep evolutionary roots. <laughs>